Okay, so the industrial grain oilseed livestock complex is uh, the, the uh, what I describe as oceans of monocultures, uh, and oceans of uh, coarse grain and uh, oilseed monocultures are devoted principally to animal feed. Uh, so in North America, Canada and the U.S., a large share of our arable land, that's, that is land given to crops, uh, permanent crops, is uh, devoted not directly to foods that are consumed by people, but uh, crops that are uh, going into animal feed that are uh, fed to concentrated populations of animals, uh, factory farm pigs and chickens, principally also increasingly dairies be, be becoming uh, increasingly factory farmed, and then also feedlot cattle. Um, so cattle are often um, started on pasture and finished on, on feedlots, uh, which also ties to these uh, grain and oilseed monocultures. So the industrial grain oilseed livestock complex is this, um, the, the uh, mo monocultures of, of a small number of coarse grains, principally corn or maize, uh, and oil seeds, principally soybeans, that are fed uh, to animals. And that th those landscapes, as I said, in North America, are, are occupy a large majority of all cropland. On a world scale, um, the uh, industrial monocultures given to animal feed control about a close to a third of all arable land. So this is an enormous force in world agriculture. Uh, coarse grain and oilseed monocultures that are being fed to concentrated populations of animals or what I describe as, as islands of animals. And those islands of animals are growing in scale, they're growing uh, in populations, uh, again, principally poultry and pigs, and that um, uh, that growth is, is very central to uh, the contemporary dietary change that I was speaking about earlier, and it's, it's very central to projections of future dietary change. So uh, the industrial grain oilseed livestock complex is, is a huge force in world agriculture, uh, and it's a hugely uneven force. So uh, again, people in, in the United States consume vastly more, not just vastly more meat, uh, and dairy and eggs than do people in poor countries. But through that meat, dairy, uh, and eggs, they're also consuming far more grains and oil seeds because there is uh, a tremendous amount of grains and oil seeds that are embedded in industrial livestock products. Um, because the, the, to produce uh, animal flesh and, and milk and eggs, there is a lot more feed um, that has to go into those animals than comes out as, as usable nutrition. So there's the burning of usable nutrition in, in the process of cycling feed through animals to produce food. And so that's, that's another very central part of the industrial grain oilseed livestock complex is, is the metabolic losses, the metabolic losses of, of nutri plant nutrition um, as, as we uh, effectively burn usable nutrition uh, in animal metabolism to, to produce meat, dairy, and eggs. Yeah, the term eating oil is, is um, uh, was, I first saw uh, from a journalist named Richard Manning, um, and the uh, famous food systems analyst Michael Pollan uh, gave, gave one estimate of, of saying there's about 10 calories of oil embedded in one calorie of, of industrial food. And it's a very evocative estimate, 10 calories of oil, one calorie of industrial food. It's a very complicated estimate, um, but I think one of the things that um, it, it draws very effectively draws attention to whether um, you, you buy the, the terms of that estimate or whether it's, it's possible that a scientist named David Pimentel is all, at Cornell University has also done a tremendous amount of research trying to empirically uh, document how much fossil energy is embedded in, in food um, energy outputs. But the, uh, again, beyond the spe specifics of um, oil energy in 
to food energy out, um, there is this deep, uh, intractable dependence of our food system on oil and also on natural gas. And so that relates to uh, the dynamics of soil degradation. Our soils are fundamentally tied to fossil energy. Uh, our, our food system couldn't function without enormous inputs of synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, uh, phosphorus and potassium fertilizer, all of which contain very large energy budgets. Nitrogen, uh, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer is the biggest fertilizer uh, used on a world scale and it is produced overwhelmingly uh, with using natural gas as a feedstock. Phosphorus and potassium fertilizers are mined and processed and, and all of these are often shipped over great distances so there's an energy budget in the uh, uh, production, the manufacturing, the movement of, of fertilizers, the application um, and there's an energy budget in the production and movement of uh, pesticides. There's often an energy budget in irrigation, uh, running irrigation against gravity, irrigation flows against gravity. And because landscapes have become so specialized, uh, you know, in the, in the U.S. Is, is a great example of this. You know, there's a wheat belt and there's a corn belt and there are huge um, landscapes that are given to a single or maybe two crops and because of that incredible specialization of landscapes food must move over further and further distances. In many cases the feed cr crops move over great distances to get to the animals. So North Carolina is a big pig state uh, and a lot of it's the feed crops have to move in there from, from further across distance. So there's an energy budget in moving things further and further across space as, as production uh, becomes more and more specialized. Um, so there is the, the energy budget in the, the soils and the fertilizers, soils meaning the degradation of soils that um, necessitate the, the huge consumption of fertilizers and the pesticides to manage the weeds and the um, insects and the, the fungus that are at greater risk in, in the cases of, of industrial monocultures. Uh, there's the irrigation pumping against gravity. There's the movement of things across greater distances. In livestock, there's the energy budgets that are embedded in factory farms um, and, and the movement of things across greater distances. And in many cases, animals move at multiple stages of their, their um, growing uh, in, in systems of industrial livestock from um, uh, birth to uh, growing to slaughter uh, and and then there's also the energy budget in, in uh, the uh, large-scale slaughterhouses, packing plants and uh, the disproportionate um, energy budgets associated with refrigeration. Uh, so all of that together uh, is, is part of that phrase that modern agriculture uh, is, is like petro farming. Uh, another phrase, a quote that I love from Brett Clark and Richard York is that modern agriculture has become the art of turning oil into food. Uh, and, and again, it's this, our, our food system is deeply uh, entangled with, with fossil energy consumption. And, um, and that also ties to its, its, its uh, very large contribution to climate change and, and CO2 emissions. So Francis Moore Lappe, uh, whose famous book Diet for a Small Planet, uh, was the first to, to, or one of the first people to really identify uh, the, the, the large flows of grain that were going to concentrated animals. And so she, uh, at that time it was principally grain, uh, but, uh, and less oil seeds, but she basically emphasized that um, we were burning a lot of the usable nutrition in crops by cycling them through animals. So she used this term, the uh, protein factory, um, to identify the historic role of small livestock populations in mixed farming systems through most of agricultural history. And what she emphasized is that for, um, for most of agrarian history, uh, where there were small mixed livestock populations, those livestock populations fed off of um, complementary land uses in the sense that they um, fed from crop stubble, they fed on fallowed lands, they fed on food scraps from farm households. Um, so now there might have been some production to um, 
uh, from crops to help animals over winter in temperate, temperate climates. But in a general sense, farm animals weren't competing with humans for the crops that humans were cultivating. Uh, the farm animals were um, getting their nutrition uh, on, on marginal lands or again in complementary land uses like crop stubble or crop uh, or eating um, the um, wastes of, of farm households and, and again animals in very small population densities and, and mixed farm animal populations. So she used, described that dynamic again which prevailed through most of agrarian history. Now there were some uh, agricultural civilizations where livestock didn't, weren't very significant, especially most of the Americas uh, prior to, to European conquest. But for uh, where animals were a part of agricultural systems, uh, again, they were in, in low de relatively low densities, in, and in, she describes the uh, protein factory role as, as reflecting the fact that they were generating a relatively scarce nutrient po protein in complementary associations with cropping systems. And so that's her term, that they were protein factories, they were uh, generating, and, and in the protein generation it was uh, in many cases more through milk and eggs than through flesh. Um, and then she coins this term that I, I find so valuable, reverse protein factories, uh, to describe the dynamic of cycling grains, and, and as I said, not now uh, very heavily oil seeds as well, through animals to produce protein is effectively burning protein. So whereas animals were generating a scarce nutrient protein in complementary associations in, in mixed farming systems when they were at very low densities and, and feeding um, not principally off of crops, now they're commanding more and more of the world's arable land, huge uh, shares of, of um, uh, farmland. Uh, on a global scale, and, and again in North America, the majority of crops are given to principally to animal feed on a world scale, close to a third of all arable land given to crops that are going into animals. And, and so she uh, was, one, again, one of the first people to identify the, the immense nutritional inefficiency in that process, in that dynamic of feeding grains, and, and, and again, increasingly oil seeds to livestock, you're basically burning a lot of the usable nutrition in plant uh, production uh, as it is lost in animals' metabolism before it becomes flesh, uh, milk, and, and eggs. And so she, uh, I think, very, very valuably, 40 years ago identified, the, or more than 40 years ago now, identified that dynamic of rising flows of, of grains through livestock to produce food is very intensely inefficient. It's intensely unequal on a world scale. So again, it means that pe people who are consuming more meat are consuming far more grains as well than, than, than uh, poorer parts of the world and, and more tied to more resources in that production. Uh, but sadly, though she identified it more than 40 years ago, um, that analysis has, has just become more and more and more pertinent over time. So agriculture is uh, the biggest consumer of fresh water on a world scale uh, by far, and it is the biggest consumer and polluter uh, on a world scale. And so there are many uh, stresses facing freshwater ecosystems. Uh, and agriculture is, is a central part of that, and, and freshwater scarcity in many parts of the world poses great threats to agricultural productivity. And we've seen that very starkly in, in California in, in recent years uh, and in some other uh, parts of the, the world. Um, so freshwater scarcity uh, uh, in, in is very uneven on a world scale, so many of the, the world's poorest countries um, uh, face some of the most proximate threats of uh, freshwater scarcity uh, in the semi-arid tropics, and those are some of the regions that are, are threatened to be most adversely affected by climate change. Uh, so rising average temperatures, rising aridity will place greater uh, uh, moisture stress, heat and moisture stress on crops productivity. So uh, the, one of the most proximate threats um, 
associated with freshwater scarcity, or one of the regions most proximately threatened by freshwater scarcity, is the semi-arid tropics, where a, a large share of, of the world's uh, poorest people live today. Uh, but in, you know, even in agriculturally abundant countries like the United States, freshwater scarcity is, is, a, is an increasing risk. The NASA came out with a, a major report in the last few years that looks at climate change projections for the, the, the arid west in the U.S. And, and sees it as becoming much hotter and much drier uh, in the coming uh, century, uh, which will place an, an incredible pressure on, on both the pasture land and, and, and especially on the crop production. Uh, a lot of the U.S. High Plains depends upon water that comes from uh, the Ogallala Aquifer, which is an ancient lake uh, that is uh, not being recharged and so basically as that water is withdrawn uh, it is it's like mining water it's not coming back and so that the the, the enormous dependence upon the Ogallala aquifer in the U.S. Um, is uh, is going to threaten um, crops on, on an area close to about a fifth of all uh, U.S. cropland uh, on the Ogallala aquifer uh, in the coming century as it is depleted. Now over pumping of underground aquifers is not um, only happening here, it's happening in other parts of the world. So the, the North Plain in China is also has you know similar uh, pressures of, of over pumping underground uh, uh, water uh, supplies and, and there, are, there, there are a number of other instances around the world where there's this dangerous over dependence upon um, uh, underground aquifers that are either not being recharged at all or they're over, being over pumped far at far higher than recharge rates. So there's th that, that, that's one part of the f freshwater scarcity. Another part is the, the uh, over pumping of uh, many uh, overdraft of many rivers and so uh, again the U.S. West highlights this very dramatically uh, the Colorado River which used to gush out into the Pacific Ocean now runs uh, to a trickle uh, long before it reaches the Pacific Ocean and that's you know um, a product of the the huge withdrawals that happen all throughout the, the Colorado uh, river um, system where it runs and so that um, reliance and the, and the over pumping of, of um, river uh, uh, supplies in many parts of the world it generates momentous ecological changes in those, those uh, river ecosystems and the riparian system and the uh, in many cases rivers the that are reliant on uh, glacial melt are, are also facing long-term diminishing um, uh, annual uh, runoff as, as glaciers shrink. And this was a big part of the California droughts in, in recent years was that the uh, high mountain glaciers mass is shrinking with climate change. And we know this you know, e everywhere uh, around the world um, uh, temperate uh, and uh, and low latitude glacier mass is is in rapid retreat and, and glacier mass in the poles as well but um, in in places like California uh, glacial mass the, the, the annual runoff um, the, the spring melt from glaciers is, is an important part of the water that goes into some of the rivers there uh, as those glaciers shrink there's going to be uh, decreasing water uh, d discharged every spring. Uh, one of the countries that has been mo le most outspoken about the threats to climate change is uh, the, in, in South America, in the heartland of South America, Bolivia, which some people might not think of as one that is uh, most threatened by climate change because it's not in a low-lying area, so it's not threatened by sea level rise. It's one of the highest, or very high elevation countries, um, landlocked, and it is um, also uh, wouldn't have in many parts of Bolivia wouldn't have the same pressures from heat stress. So why is Bolivia so concerned about climate change? Well, one of the biggest reasons why is because it's fresh water supplies are uh, very heavily tied to uh, the annual discharge from the Andes 
the glacial mass in the Andes, which is uh, very dramatically declining. Uh, so freshwater scarcity um, is, is, is very significantly linked to um, uh, climate change uh, and, and the, the, the declining mass of glaciers is, is one part of that story. Uh, another part of the story with, with climate change is that um, increasing average temperatures uh, drive increasing aridity, uh, and in some cases dry areas are projected to be much drier, so there's going to be greater water demands if um, uh, agriculture is, is to be viable in, in certain regions. So um, there, uh, the, the climate change is, is increasingly interconnected with uh, freshwater stresses in, in many parts of the world. One of the things I've tried to do with, with the discussion of metification is to stress that it is a momentous issue for social justice, it's a momentous issue for uh, environmental change, environmental degradation, the loss of biodiversity, climate change, and it's a mo momentous aspect of how human beings interact uh, with other animals and increasingly other animals. Um, that they don't see or think about that are hidden in our landscapes. Their lives are governed in greater intensity with greater violence, uh, but and people are consuming them at a greater scale than, than ever before, uh, but they're losing uh, the sort of sight, falling out of sight and consciousness in our modern world. So one of the things I hope to do with, with the discussion of metification is, is to stress how it connects to global inequality. Uh, it reflects global inequality. It is something uh, rich countries consume vastly more meat than do poor countries. It's also exacerbating global inequalities, both in the, in the uneven pull on the world's grain and oil seed supplies and other resources, and also in, the, in terms of the contribution to climate change. Uh, and again, it's increasingly bearing on the lives of um, billions and billions of animals who are uh, increasingly farmed in intensive ways. Uh, so it has this momentous bearing on our relationship with other species. And so I think, for me, my, one of the hopes with uh, the, the discussion of metification is to, is to position it centrally as, as an issue of, of social justice, uh, any hopes for uh, challenging uh, the, the, the trajectory of, of environmental degradation we're on, I think we need to confront this very centrally and, and in terms of building more humane uh, and equitable uh, and sustainable societies, I think uh, that dealing with the, the vector of metification is, is really uh, inescapable.